Uh, great to see you here this morning. And I think our program today is going to be a good one. And so I will move toward introducing our speaker today, Andy Mark. Uh, Andy and I first really got to know each other, I don't know how many years ago, but really it came about uh, he and I meeting each other and uh, going out to adventure together out into Ishii country, where we both had a real interest in the Ishii story, and Andy had really already uh, probed and adventured and explored there uh, extensively in Deer and Mill Creeks. And then we did some good things together there in probably the 1990s and uh, maybe not the 90s. Anyway, somewhere late 90s and on through that first decade of this century, uh, we uh, visited some of the more obscure spots in Ishii and had a good time with that. And then Andy began to really uh, start his writing career. And he published several newspaper articles, I think, early on, on local issues, uh, particularly uh, Native people and white relationships here in Butte County. And then he put out his first book right here. And this one was really on the theme that I really found of interest because I knew uh, something about it. My dad had been interested in the West Branch Mill of the Sierra Lumber Company. So that's the title here on this first book. And of course that West Branch Mill was right upstream on Big Chico Creek. The creek that comes down right through our community right behind us here, right through Chico State. So at one time there, beginning in about 1895 and running through probably only another, the first five, six, seven years of the 20th century, a very large mill there in the bottom of the Chico Creek Canyon. And of course, one of the interesting little facets of that story was that Dr. Newton Enlow had come to California and became the company doctor for Sierra Lumber Company, and his first hospital was there at this West Branch Mill. And, of course, there are a few lingering pictures of just this little cabin and a one-room office where he would carry out his medical uh, duties, uh, whatever he had to do. So very interesting there, and Andy covers that in the book. And then, of course, uh, another theme that I really was interested in, this is Andy's second book here, and he'll be uh, presenting on this book today. We have these for sale here at the museum. We're uh, trying to get copies of the first book there on the Sierra Lumber Company, but this one here, Stories in the Humboldt Road, where Andy spent several years going through the newspapers, just combing through the Chico newspapers and finding information there that really he would use to build this book here. So again, it's a, pre a pleasure to present Andy Mark, and I'm going to turn it over to him. All right. Well, thank you, Dave, for that wonderful introduction. And I want to thank all of you for being here today. Uh, like I said, my name is Andy Mark, and today I'd like to share a true story with you uh, that's uh, in my book, Stories of the Humble Wagon Road, like Dave showed you, about Chico's role in the mad rush for silver in the Black Rock Desert of northwestern Nevada in the years 1866 and 1867. Now, uh, the following presentation is a condensed version of what's in my book, but it has some new information in it and many more images, so it's going to be a little different. And uh, I like to think of it as kind of a supplement to what's in my book. The events, uh, the sequence of events leading up to and during this silver rush have been told by other historians before, uh, in particular a man named uh, Acer Fairfield in his 1916 book, Fairfield's Pioneer History of Lassen County, California. Oh, okay, can you hear me better now? But no one, to my knowledge, has ever mentioned the Chico connection. And it just turns out that uh, some of the prospectors from Chico were 
closely with the most controversial person in this story. And we have one person who is a very well-known historical figure in Northern California who was also part of the Silver Rush. So without further delay, let's get on with this story about a lost silver ledge that was reported to have been rediscovered and then the rush was on. To begin with, uh, where is the Black Rock Desert? Well, on this map, we can see Chico, it's near the star, and the arrow northeast of that is pointing to the center of the Black Rock Desert in northwestern Nevada. As the crow flies, it's about 175 miles. Now, depending on the source back in the day, it was uh, between 210 to 219 miles by road. Now, because the Humboldt Wagon Road played a, a big part in this silver rush, I'd like to briefly go over some of its early history and show how it uh, opened the door for the prospectors from uh, uh, Chico to mine the Black Rock Desert. So we'll start with uh, 1860, and this is when John Bidwell laid out the town of Chico. And by then, his agricultural operations were well underway. And uh, it was then that he started thinking maybe shipping out products from those uh, operations like his, you know, field crops, his orchards, his livestock to a, a bigger market and to secure Chico's future. So, in 1861, when the news broke that there was a silver strike in the Humboldt range of northwestern Nevada, John Bidwell thought this might be his opportunity. So that's when he first uh, proposed a Trans-Sierra uh, wagon road to go to the Humboldt mines with Chico as a valley terminal. And, uh, and that's where the Humboldt wagon road got its name. That was its original uh, intent, was to lead to the Humboldt mines. Now on this map, uh, Chico's near the star again, and now the area I mean, the arrow is pointed directly towards the Humboldt range. Uh, as the crow flies, it's about 200 miles. Now, if you can tell I've uh, circled the town of Unionville there. And Unionville uh, had a newspaper called the Humboldt Register. And in 1865, it listed all the stations between Chico and Unionville and the distance between them, and it determined that the distance between Chico and Unionville was 270 miles. And it was a little longer because uh, the road went northeast up to the Black Rock Desert, to the southern end of it, then went east from there until it hit the Humboldt River and then went southwest from there. So uh, back to the sequence events here. Uh, in 1863, or excuse me, 1862, there was another silver strike, this time in southwestern Idaho. And this prompted John Biddle to really get busy on his road. And uh, because now, not only was he gonna, the road gonna lead to the mines of uh, northwestern Nevada, but now they're gonna lead to the mines of southwestern Idaho. And uh, in September of that year, the news reported that the uh, Bidwell knocked out a 65 mile road over the Sierras, which suggests to me that the road to Big Meadows was completed. In 1863, John Biddle and four others received a 20 year franchise to build and operate a toll road between Chico and Susanville, a distance of 100 miles. And in 1864, the Chico and Humboldt Wagon Road was incorporated with John Bidwell, the chief shareholder. In 1865, John Bidwell got together with some businessmen from Idaho and they created a stage line to go from Chico to Idaho and back. Uh, and this is a portion of a map that showed that entire line from Chico to Idaho, but I cropped it to uh, uh, about in half to focus on the area that we're most interested in. The map was uh, drawn by uh, John Mullen, who was a road builder 
uh, for the stage line. He drew the map in 1865. And it's a pretty good map. It uh, gives you a good sense of how the road went. Uh, and it's got the stations and everything on it. Uh, it's a little inaccurate in, as far as some of the relationships between some of the features. But in, you know, considering it's a pretty good map. Yeah, I gotta do a little manipulation here so I can see what I'm doing. Okay, this is the same map, of course, except now I've added this broken black line to it. Uh, but we'll get to that in a second. First, I want to start from the beginning of the road, which is Chico. Chico's down here at the lower left-hand corner. And the road crawled through the foothills and climbed over the mountains. And about here, it reached a high point at 6,600 feet. Uh, and it was called the Big Summit. That was the highest point on the Chico and Humboldt Wagon Road. And then it uh, dropped down on the east side of Sierras, went through Big Meadows, and then the rest of the way to Susanville, 100 miles. Now, the road originally went north from Susanville up to the Madeline Plain, then went east into Nevada and did a U-turn in Nevada went back west into California, went north up to Surprise Valley, and then east over to Summit Lake. Uh, that's not real precise, but I wanted to give you an idea of how much this road wandered around. And that's why later in the year, they decided to eliminate this section of the road and move it eastward. And now the road went through the Black Rock Desert. And that uh, gave the prospectors from Chico that were going to work the Brock Brock Mines easier access to it. They even take a stage to it in the early years. Now, before we leave this map, I want to show you one more thing. Up in the upper right-hand corner, it says, this range is rich in gold and silver quartz. It's talking about the Black Rock Range. And uh, we're going to know a lot about the Black Rock Range here real quick. So I'm going to get out of this. Uh, thing right here. Move on to the next slide. And here is a photo of the Black Rock. Uh, it's a desert namesake and it's located at the southern end of the Black Rock Range. Uh, it's about, and I'm going to guesstimate, uh, it's about 600 feet from the base to the top. It, because of its coloring, it really stood out. It was a great reference point uh, for the uh, immigrants and anybody else who were, uh, was traveling out there. Now between me and the Black Rock you can see this dry lake bed called a playa. This playa is made up of sediments deposited by the ancient Lake Lahontan during the last ice age and it's pretty devoid of life thanks to thousands of years of evaporation was concentrated salt and minerals into an inhospitable environment for plants and animals. The playa is shaped like a Y. It goes up both sides of the Black Rock Range and you can see the Black Rock Range in the center of this photo. And then the third leg goes southwest down to the town towards the town of Gerlach. Now this Black Rock Playa is uh, supposedly one of the largest flat spots on earth, along with the Bonneville salt flats. Thank you, Debbie, for reminding me of that. Uh, the Black Rock Playa is about 200 square miles, which makes it ideal for activities that require a lot of space, like setting the world land speed record. In 1997, a jet-propelled car named Thrust SSC, uh, driven by Royal Air, British Royal Air Force pilot Andy Green, shot across the Black Rock Desert floor at 763 miles an hour, thereby being the first land vehicle to break the sound barrier. And this is almost 50 years to the day after Chuck Yeager did it up in the sky. He did it in 1947, and these guys did it on land in uh, 1997, and on October 15th, Jaeger did it on October 14th. 
Unfortunately, uh, this particular picture is not him breaking the sound barrier. It's during a warm-up trial about a week or two before. Uh, they were out there several weeks getting ready for this event. Uh, I missed it by one day. I wanted to be out there for the day they did it, but I didn't. But I got this one. It's pretty exciting to just see him go 550 miles an hour. <laughs> Uh, oh, thank you. <laughs> well, from a distance, uh, pretty exciting for him, I'm sure. Uh, well, in order to do this, they needed a 13-mile track. The first six miles, they got up to speed, and then the seventh mile, they uh, measured the speed, and then they needed six miles to slow the vehicle back down to a stop and deploy a parachute to have to do that. Then to make it official, he had to turn around, pack away his parachute, and do the same thing going the other direction within an hour. And so we actually had two runs. And uh, then his credited speed was the average of those two runs. That's where the 763 miles comes from. So, you know, something like this uh, requires a little bit of space. And the Black Rock Desert has it. Another thing that goes on out here in the Black Rock Desert is amateur rocket clubs come out here and they shoot off their rockets way up into the sky. Uh, some of these people, you know, are just hobbyists. You might be the guy right down the street from you that's in the rocketry and he just wanted to test his little thing out. Uh, but uh, there's some uh, really uh, uh, interesting uh, premier clubs that come out here. Oregon State University has a uh, a club that comes out here, Triple E Rocketry Association is out here on a regular basis, and these people do a lot of experimental rocketry and a lot of research. Now, uh, this photo was taken when my wife and I were back there in September, and she took this photo, thank you, Jill. And uh, they said the rockets, uh, um, we were out there just for a few hours, and they said the rockets, uh, some of the rockets that they were blasting off that day went between 15 and 20 miles up in the sky. Now I know in the past sometimes they go 30, 40 miles. The all-time record for a rocket launching from the Black Rock Desert floor is 73 miles. Now to put this in perspective, remember last month when William Shatner went up in Blue Horizon? He went up 66 miles. So what goes up must come down, right? Uh, hopefully with the parachute, but not always. So, uh, uh, you know, something like this requires a lot of room. And the Black Rock Desert has it. But perhaps what the Black Rock Desert is most well known for is the Burning Man Festival that happens out here every year since uh, 2020. Right? Yeah. Uh, and, uh, no, not 2020, since, since 1990. Sorry, excuse me, my mistake. In 2020, it, there were two exceptions, 2020 and 2021. Why? Because of COVID, right. But that didn't stop some renegade burners, as a newspaper called them, from going out there. And 5,000 showed up in, uh, in 2020, and 15,000 showed up in 2021, I believe. But they did not have a permit. They were not authorized. So anyway, they have this festival that's out there, and it lasts about a week. And they burn their effigy. It's a little over a week, actually. They burn their effigy towards the end, and then they pack everything up, pick up their mess, and leave. And, and hopefully, uh, don't, uh, they leave nothing behind but a big imprint in the, in the desert soil. Now, lately, the, uh, it's, this festival is accommodating as many as 80,000 people. So you figure that's got to take up a lot of space. And the Black Rock Desert has it. Well, now that we're familiar with the Black Rock Desert, let's get on with our story. In 1849, a wagon train was crossing the Black Rock Desert uh, on the Applegate Lassen Immigrant Trail. And it stopped at the west side of the Black Rock Range. And a man called James Harden, and the story goes that he was probably accompanied by maybe one or two other men, got off to hunt for some game. And while they were tromping around the canyons in the Black Rock Range, 
they stumble across this bright, shiny, metallic stuff on the ground, and they pick it up and they think, well, it looks like lead. Let's take it back to the campsite and fashion it into bolts over a campfire. I don't think that was really accomplished. But anyway, the, uh, the wagon train eventually made it to California, and James Harden settled in Petaluma, and he brought some of the rock with him. And he had it assayed a few years later, and it turned out it was high in silver content. So Harden organizes this party to go back to the Black Rock Desert in 1858 to go looking for this silver ledge. But he couldn't find it. Either the uh, terrain had changed, or he simply forgot what it was. And then he came back the next year, and some say the year after that, still no success. In 1859, the famous pioneer, Peter Lassen, he hears of the Silver Ledge, and he wants to go looking for it. At the time, Peter Lassen is living in Honey Lake Valley. Honey Lake, uh, Susanville is at the northwest end of Honey Lake Valley. So Lassen, he makes plans with these two other guys, Lamericus Wyatt and Edward Clapper, to go out to the Black Rock Desert and do some prospecting. And they also made arrangements to meet a Captain Weatherlow out there, uh, who also had a group of prospectors that were going to go out there. And uh, so they uh, made plans to rendezvous with him. And now Pac uh, Weatherlow was leaving about two days earlier than Lassen and his two companions. When Lassen goes out there, uh, he goes to the rendezvous point, but there's no weather low to be seen or his group. So Lassen and his uh, two friends camp in this canyon in a Black Rock range that night. And the next morning, for some undetermined reason, an unknown sniper or snipers fired at him from the ridge above, killing Edward Clapper and Peter Lassen. Lamericus Wyatt, he managed to make a miraculous escape. He got a horse that wasn't even saddled, hopped on it, and rode all the way back to Honey Lake Valley bare, uh, uh, bareback to tell of the tragedy. And here's the murder site. This is in black, this is, I took this photo back in 2010. And uh, you can see there's a marker there. And by the way, before I go any further, in case I know this is a place of significance historically, and uh, if you ever have the hankering to go on out here, it's in a very remote part of Black Rock Desert. Don't even think about it unless you have a high clearance four wheel drive and you're packing lots of water. But anyway, so in 2010, uh, I took this photo and we see the marker there. And the marker tells you a little bit about Lassen's background and describes the murder. <coughs> and it says that the murder. Uh, the men were camped close to this big boulder uh, that's on the right-hand side of the marker. Can you see that in the upper left-hand uh, photo? Can you make that out or do I want... I can point it out here real quick. Right here, this boulder right there. They, they were camped right there, supposedly. Well, uh, back to our story. So, uh, Lamericus White, he goes back to Honey Lake Valley to report the tragedy, and then some people come out from Honey Lake Valley and bury Lassen and Clapper on the spot. And later that year, uh, some Freemasons come out, uh, apparently Lassen was a Mason, and they got Lassen's remains and brought it back to Honey Lake Valley to give him a proper burial, but left after Edward Clapper's behind. And so over time, the site of the murder was forgotten. People forgot where it was. Until 2000, or excuse me, there's that, I'm having trouble with this, 1990, the year 1990, when the Burning Man started. <laughs> uh, when some desert recreationists were out there poking around in this canyon, some say they were rock hounds, and they came across these bones sticking out of the bank. And uh, so they turned it into the proper authorities, and the FBI and the Smithsonian Institute got involved, and they determined it was the bones of Edward Clapper, 131 years after he was killed. And then, 
they came up with this neat computer-aided sketch of what Edward Clapper's face would have looked like. And you can see this on, at the Lassen Historical Museum in Susanville. It's on the wall. It's pretty neat, huh? So for the next few years, prospecting in the Black Rock Desert slowed down. Uh, partly because of Indian hostilities. And maybe even mostly because of Indian hostilities. But, you know, less prospectors out there. It was just too dangerous to be there. But a few stayed behind and persevered, although they weren't having a heck of a lot of luck. Uh, there was a brief spike in uh, 1860, I understand, but it was short-lived. This is a painting uh, by Frederick Remerton, the famous Western artist. And it actually represents a scene in which cowboys are having a conflict with Plains Indians. But it really resembles the Black Rock Desert kind of nicely, a lot. And so I thought I'd throw it in there to give us a sense of what it was like. Back to our story. So uh, prospecting slowed down after uh, a few years after Lassen was killed and uh, with not much success. But then, in January of 1866, everything changed. Reports came out in the news that the hardened ledge had finally been found, and many other potentially productive wedges, ledges too, some, oops, some hundreds of feet wide and miles long. Prospectors swarmed in from everywhere, especially the Honey Lake Valley, Susanville area, because they were closest to the action. The Chico Current, which is, was Chico's newspaper at the time, they wanted to keep track of the events. Uh, and the results were anywhere from $140 per ton to $340 per ton. And this was enough to convince everybody. They were excited, okay. So they ordered two more mills for the Black Rock region. And Eisenbeck was hired by the Hardin City Mill owners at $1,000 a month. Yeah, so pretty cushy. And the Chico prospectors, they decided to get serious too. So on September 21st, uh, 1867, the Chico Gold and Silver Mining Company was incorporated to extract gold, silver, and other metals and acquire whatever property was necessary in the Hardin District of Humboldt County, Nevada. Now on this middle page, you can see the 13 original investors. On the top we see James Martin, we know who he was, he was that lawyer. George Allen was a constable in Chico at one time. Randall Rico, I couldn't find anything on him other than the fact uh, I got his death notice, uh, but uh, nothing about his life at all. Thomas McFadden, he was supposedly the first tinsmith in Chico, and uh, he had a shop on Main Street. F.F. Johnson, otherwise known as Frank Johnson, I believe he was in the hotel business, and he may have been the proprietor of the St. Nicholas Hotel in Oroville for many years. Uh, when he came to Chico, he was, uh, he got together with, he partnered with uh, a hotel owner called Ira Weatherby, which we'll get to right here quickly. In fact, here we are, Ira Weatherby. Now, Ira Weatherby uh, was part owner of the claim that was credited with finding the 54-pound Dogtown Nugget back in 1859. And with, you know, uh, all these earnings that he got from that, he went into hotel business. It was pretty successful. And uh, below that we have A.C. Longmore. A.C. Longmore lived in uh, Chico for many years and some say in Butte Creek Canyon. Uh, but, but in the early 60s he went to Susanville and he founded this uh, Sagebrush newspaper. Uh, we have W.H. Duran. He was a Justice of the Peace, uh, Notary Republic, and conveyancer. And below that we have J.C. Mandeville. J.C. Mandeville was one of the people that got the 20-year franchise to build and operate a toll road between Chico and Susanville. Now I don't know who Edmund White is, uh, John Bidwell, uh, can't add 
uh, things we've already said about him. You got plenty about him. Then there's Lafayette Fargo and H. Leslie, and I don't know either of those people either. And here's John Bidwell in 1865, a couple years before this. Here's Ira, this is an advertisement for Ira A. Weatherby's hotel while he was out there uh, in the Black, I don't know if he actually, he actually went to the Black Rock Desert, uh, he, but definitely he was part of the group and he was nothing else, he was at least a backer. But he owned this, uh, he was a proprietor of this hotel on Broadway and 2nd Street. In 1864, that hotel burned down. And I believe this is the hotel that he set up, rebuilt, on 2nd and Salem. Mm, that sounds familiar, doesn't it? Yeah, I think it was right here, maybe. Does anybody know which corner it was exactly? Here's George Allen's business card and W.H. Dern's business card. And here's a copy of a Gold Silver Mining Company stock certificate. You can see that James Martin is the secretary and John Bidwell is the president. This particular shareholder is J.C. Mandeville. So things are looking pretty good until about mid-November when it started to go sour. It was looking gloomy. When 10 tons of the Black Rock ore were crushed at the mill at Hardin City that was operating, it was specially suited to suit Eisenbeck's process and it turned up nothing, absolutely nothing. L. Bass, the part owner of the mill, and Eisenbeck immediately got into it and gave different stories to the press. And uh, not too long after that, Eisenbeck seems to have disappeared. Fled the scene. <laughs> and uh, now the Chico Current suddenly became silent itself. It was no longer bragging about the, uh, black, the richness of the Black Rock mines. And it, it was smelling around, no doubt about it. And the uh, Humboldt Register from Unionville, it decided to do some homework on its own. And it found out that Eisenbeck had a history of fraud. And they printed a story about how Eisenbeck had uh, duped the people of Montgomery, California in a similar fashion and had injured one person economically pretty bad who had put up the money for building a uh, smelting furnace that was never in use and it was never necessary because they never had anything there. But the Black Rockers had not given up hope. And in December, they put a new mill there in uh, Hardin City called the Atchison Mill. Atchison Mill. And uh, they ran two more runs there, five tons apiece, but still nothing, the same dismal results. And they ran some runs after that, still nothing. By January, uh, all hope was pretty much lost. And by the spring of the following year, everybody abandoned the area. So, it's been said that over 15,000 people streamed into Hardin City during its brief existence. How could Eisenbeck have duped so many of them? I mean, these weren't dummies. I mean, some of them were successful businessmen. They had, you know, they're of high intellect. So what's going on here? Well, to start out with, you got to figure some of them had the fever, right? I mean, the gold and silver fever whose symptoms include clouded judgment and gullibility. <laughs> but uh, now, uh, one theory has, but what about Dahl's Mill? Oh, well, let me go back. Obviously something 
more than that though, more than just gullibility. Eisenbeck must have salted the ores. I mean, that's really the only logical answer. But what about Dahl's Mill that was getting all these great results when Eisenbeck wasn't even around? Well, Fairfield proposes that it's possible that the batteries and pans at Dahl's Mill had some leftover residue from the Comstock load when they were crushing the black rock ore and that some of that residue broke off and gave false results to the black rock ore. Now the Chico current, probably in defense of the choice its citizens had made, decided it, was, it should defend Eisenbeck a little bit and it was wondering why Eisenbeck was uh, shouldering all the blame. And uh, it even went uh, so far as to accuse J.B. Hiskey of salting the ore. So, I'd like to go back to the murder site there at, uh, at uh, where Lassen and his companions were murdered. And these two photos on top are photos that I took in two different years. The first one was 2010. You saw that one already. And then I took another one in 2020. You can see I still like that same old car. <laughs> and uh, the photo at the, the bottom was taken by a member of the uh, Black Rock Explorer Society. And he told me he believed it was taken in 2012. So in 2010, we've already seen that. You can see the boulder pretty clearly. In 2012, something happened. Some major event occurred there. And now the boulder's got all these other boulders around it. Okay, I don't know if you can still make out the uh, marker there. You know, to the right of it, the boulder is where they were camping. Uh, you look at it and you go, well, which boulder? And then in 2020, uh, things are still looking a little different. But even gets more dramatic when you look up the canyon. And uh, you can see uh, that in 2010, it was a narrow ravine with lots of vegetation. And then you go down, you look at 2012, and this, it's just scoured. This canyon is just scoured with these rocks. This major flash flood event went through it. And then in 2020, it appears to be reclaiming itself even a little bit. So the point I'm trying to make is that in the canyons in the Black Rock Range, things can happen drastically and suddenly. And so you wonder, is it possible? Is there still a silver ledge out there somewhere? <laughs> Harden certainly thought so. You know, he went back looking for it, although it was this bright, shiny stuff, metallic looking stuff that he found, not the black waxy ore that was 66, 67 silver rush. But you know, uh, you know, maybe there is something out there that's been covered up and just waiting for some gully washer to come through and expose it once more. I know when I go out there, I'm always keeping an eye out for it. <laughs> and maybe, you know, maybe one of you guys might be interested in going out there someday and seeing if, if you can find it. So if you don't mind hot days, cold nights, and unpredictable winds, sharing your blood with a few mosquitoes, ticks, and gnats, and maybe sidestepping a rattlesnake here or there, or then the Black Rock Desert just might be the place for you. <laughs> uh, but I, I'm, not, I'm not quite finished, but I'm getting there. Uh, this is one of those critters we were just talking about, rattlesnakes. And I saw this one about, oh, about three or four miles from uh, Arden City in the Black Rock Range. I'm just about done here. Now, uh, no luck trying, uh, finding any silver? Well, you can always find pretty rocks nearby. Again, these were found about somewhere between two or four miles from Hardin City in the Black Rock Range. My wife and I collected these. Some of these we cut with our saw, others are left natural. So before I leave you, I want to show you one more slide. Now, in case you do decide someday to go out to the Black Rock Desert and you want to take the shortest way out there, you would uh, more or less follow the Nobles Trail out of Susanville. 
And part of that trail is a dirt road and it goes to the Smoke Creek Desert area. And uh, I gotta give you a heads up that if you do happen to go that way someday, you may have to go through some inspection stations that are run by Wild Burroughs and they really give you the look over <laughs> and that's it. Now you have to. So do we have any questions? Yeah, go ahead. What happened to the humble Utah or the road that people tried to build up there? Was it ever used? Uh, the one to Idaho? Yeah, Idaho. Yeah, uh, it, it, uh, it had a mail contract and the mail tra contract expired because there was other competing roads. And uh, the thing that really uh, did put an end to it was the, uh, the railroad, the Intercontinental Railroad. And uh, the Central Pacific, when it got, it reached the big bend of the Humboldt River up in that area, it already cut off half the route to Idaho. So it might as well take a train rather than a bumpy old stage. And so it was no longer used. But uh, the Humboldt Wagon Road itself, between Chico and Susanville, was used for quite a year, few years afterwards. Yeah. So, so you stated that John Bidwell sent samples for essay over to Germany. Yeah. And they came back okay. So good, yeah, they came back really good. And that's what inspired them to go even further. And the, but the, the fellow that was doing the essay locally. Well, he felt. Was he from Germany also? Well, Eisenbeck. Was, Eisenbeck, yeah. Eisenbeck was from Germany. Do they go to the same school? <laughs> you know what I'm the, saying? Uh, well, the They're both positive and, and everything. Oh yeah, well I'm saying yeah. That, in fact, Eisenbeck came from Germany. He graduated from the uh, Freiburg Institute, and uh, those are the ones I guess that uh, gave the letter back to. Bidwell saying that, yeah, this stuff is great. So, yeah, you're right. You wonder if there's something going on here. But another thing you got to take into consideration, these are newspaper reports, and you kind of wonder how accurate they were about some things. And also maybe just the quality of the chemistry that they're using to, to say the material themselves is pretty primitive or mm -hmm. leading to scandals. Or yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah, I really, and again, this is a newspaper just reporting it. So, you know, you'd see, you think a respected university would not say something false to John Bidwell, but this is what the way the newspaper reported it. Oh, yeah, that's pretty obvious. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Any, okay, yeah. The rurals, when was that picture taken? Oh, no, somewhere within the last five years, maybe. What, oh no, actually that one was taken last last uh, last September when we went. Yeah, but we've been seeing burrows out there for a long, long time. Really? Yeah. We traveled the wagon road all the way across Nevada and cleared it down here to Wyoming. Mm-hmm. And did you go through that section I was telling you about to go by the uh, Smoke Creek Desert? Well, my wife and I have been going out there for 35 years. And sometimes we go through a dry spell, you don't see burrows, but we often see them a lot. We saw a lot of horses. Yeah, you see horses. Yeah, you see, yeah. The, well, the burrows are hanging out near the Smoke Creek area for some reason. You don't see them so much in Black Rock. Yeah. Uh, but you see horses and burrows out there. Yeah. The horse is a little more skittish, the burrows just kind of hang out on the side of the road and look at you. <laughs> oh yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Um, the sniper that shot uh, Peter Lassen yeah. and the other fellow, um, and then the third person, mm -hmm. he, he jailed it out of there. Right. Was there any effort to find that person? Oh yeah, there's lots of theories floating around. Uh, some people think that it might have been Wyatt himself who shot him and ran back, ran, came, went back to Honey Lake Valley and came up with this phony story. Why he would shoot him, I don't know. Weatherlow, the other guy they were supposed to meet, was a suspect. But I really believe most people, like I, think it was probably Indians that did it. The funny thing about Weatherlow is, Weatherlow, a few years later, was, ended up with Lassen's rifle. And he said he got it off a dead Indian. So, yeah, he was, he's been a suspect too, but uh, personally I think, even though Lassen was on friendly terms with the Indians out there, uh, that uh, it was probably, maybe it might not even have been the local Indians, the Paiutes, it could have been something, uh, 
the, the Modocs, I think, and what other tribe is up there, uh, might have come down uh, and, and not even known who Lassen was and just shot him. And it could have been a prospector. It could have been another prospector. Who knows? Nobody knows. It looks like, you know, uh, it was so long ago that it's, it's going to be a mystery that's never solved. Yeah, that was the second part of my question, uh, whether that was a, a, because later you referred to uh, prospectors having to defend, you know, defend their own stake or claim, so to speak. Was that, a, that was not a common occurrence then. People getting uh, shot or killed when they were out there. Yeah, it, yeah, it was kind of a bizarre incident, to tell you the truth, it's, it, and it's, it's, it's just kind of shocking, you know, if you're a big fan of Peter Lassen like I am, you know, he's a very well-known person. He's got enough things around here named after him to remind you. Yeah. And to uh, die so, in such a bizarre way out in the, in the middle of the desert. Okay. Yeah. Uh, and there's so many suspects, they just, you know, yeah. like I said, they'll probably never know. Well, I personally believe it was Indians, but I, I don't know. I really don't know for sure. There supposedly was an Indian that came into their site that evening before they went to bed. <laughs> And actually asked for some bullets, uh, but you know he was everything was friendly and there was no you know, harsh exchange or anything like that. And I guess they gave him some bullets. I mean, and I don't know if those are the bullets were actually used. Nobody does. But uh, yeah, it's an interesting story. And he was looking for Harden's ledge too. Yes. Well, that was Dave, yeah. Yeah, well, I don't know. But I wrote about it. Yeah. I'm the author of the book that wrote about it, yeah. Were you aware that building was moved? To, uh, they under, I understand it was out, moved out to Roofer Ranch. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, I, I've heard that. I don't know if I totally believe it. Uh, I've gone out there. I know what building it is. They must have taken it completely apart. Yeah. put it back together so it doesn't look anything like the hospital. Now the problem is, the story goes, it was moved out there in 1900. Now, you know, we always give everybody a little bit of flexibility, but uh, Dr. Enlow wasn't even here in California until 1901. And uh, there's also some dispute as to where the hospital was. Some people believe it was at the stage stop on Humboldt Road about a mile and a half above the mill site. But uh, the first year he was there was down at the mill site. There's just too much evidence suggesting he was there. But then he opened up an office in Chico and stayed in Chico rather than staying at the, the mill full time. And it's possible maybe the hospital was moved after that. I don't know. But the first year was down at the mill site. And uh, if he did move, uh, maybe that was when they moved out to the Roofer Ranch and they built a new one up on the, on the hill. I don't know. Yes. They called it the West Branch, but we think of the West Branch of the Feather River, not. Right. It confuses people, and a lot of people say, "Well, you know, the other name for it was Pro Providence Mill." Uh, and uh, people say, "Why didn't you just call it the Providence Mill instead of the West Branch Mill?" Well, it was because when I went, I'm a newspaper guy. That's how I get most of my research. I borrow from other historians like Dr. Maglieri and and other people like that, Hutch Hutchinson and John Nopel and things like that. But most of my resources are from reading old newspaper articles and that's what they always refer to it as was a West Branch Mill and the reason it was called the West Branch Mill is close to that stage stop I was just talking about which only it was only a mile and a half away and that stage stop was called the West Branch stage stop because it was close to the West Branch of Butte Creek <laughs> which makes it even more confusing there's when Diamond Match took over they had a uh, a, uh, a logging camp called the West Branch Logging Camp, not too far away. Again, because of that West Branch of Butte Creek. So it's a little confusing, and I'm sorry about that. But uh, yeah, I just went with what the newspaper said. And that's why I called it the West Branch Mill. Yes, Richard. How far up to Lomo is the West Branch Mill? Lomo is farther up. up How far is Lomo from the West Branch Mill? Yeah. Uh, well, the West Branch stage stop is uh, 25 miles from Chico, and Lomo is 30 miles from Chico, so it's about five miles out. Uh, yet also the railroad went up there, and the railroad was about six miles long, 
So yes, between five and six miles, because the railroad would sneak up that canyon from the West Branch Mill to Lomo, just below Lomo. Yes, one other. You recall that High Good had a, uh, a pack train in 1866? Yes, it went on the Sage Road, yes. I wonder, I wonder if he waved to say hello or anything on the way up there. If he did what? If he stopped the wave to say hello on the way up there. Hello to who? I'm just joking. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that was something, you know, and that's when the, you know, the uh, Humboldt Wagon Road, uh, the stage line, it suffered a lot of uh, Indian depredations, and that was uh, part of the reason they closed it that first year, and so, but you know, High Good wasn't going to be scared by of any Indians. He just went through there because uh, that was the way he was, and, and we already know about him and his relationship with the Indians in Tama County. He was quite the Indian hunter and quite the hero in this, those days. Nowadays, we don't think of him as a hero, but those days, people really looked up to him because they thought he was protecting them, and he killed a lot of Indians. And one more question about the murder site. Yeah. Is there not a source that said that there was not, no uh, raiding or looting after the murder in Clapper Canyon? Mm -hmm. Well, it's not Clapper Canyon. Right that, next to it. Well, right next to it. Because it, they, it got lost and people got confused. They called the wrong canyon Clapper Canyon. Right. But uh, it had not been violated. They just killed the, the two, Clapper and Lassen, and nothing was stolen or taken out of the canyon. Yeah, right. Who said they that? just killed them. That's what makes the story even more bizarre. Why would they do it unless it was Indians wanting to kill white men? But that would be try, try to remember that the, the Indian uh, situation was kind of getting close to a fever pitch out in the Black Rock Desert. In fact, the Paiute Indian War wasn't too long after that. So things were pretty tense as it was, and that's, I think, why, uh, you know, uh, the, the prospecting slowed down. It was just, like I said, it was too dangerous to be out there at that time. What's that? Indians would have at least taken the extra horses or something. I would have thought so, right. It sounds like an inside job. <laughs> yeah. Could it could have been. Well, you mean like Weatherlow and maybe Wyatt himself? Or, but again, why would Wyatt do it, you know? Uh, unless they found something, he kept it. And he went back hunting Lake Valley. He didn't show anybody. But that's a mystery that will never be solved, probably. And it's a pretty tragic one because, you know, I, Peter Lassen might have contributed a lot more. You know, he was quite the... Uh, personality as it was, Uncle Pete was. Okay, I guess that's probably it, huh? Thanks.